Volume One, Letters Forty Three through Forty Eight of the History of Emily Montague. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of Emily Montague, Volume One, by Francis Moore Brooke. Letters Forty Three through Forty Eight. Read by Julia Niedermeyer as Mrs. Melmoth. Capricia Page as Emily Montague. Amanda Friday as Arabella Fermore. Letter 43. To Miss Montague at Sillery. Montreal, November 14th. Mr. Melmoth and I, my dear Emily, expected by this time to have seen you at Montreal. I allow something to your friendship for Miss Fermer but there is also something due to relations who tenderly love you and under whose protection your uncle left you at his death i should add that there is something due to sir george had i not already displeased you by what i've said on the subject you are not to be told that in a week the road from hence to quebec will be impassable for at least a month till the rivers are sufficiently froze to bear carriages i will own to you that i am a little jealous of your attachment to miss fermer though no one can think her more amiable than i do if you do not come this week i would wish you to stay till sir george comes down and return with him i will entreat the favour of miss fermer to accompany you to montreal which you will endeavour to make as agreeable to her as we can i have been ill of a slight fever but am now perfectly recovered sir george and mr melmoth are well and very impatient to see you here adieu my dear your affectionate e melmoth letter forty four to mrs melmoth at montreal Sillery, november twentieth i have a thousand reasons my dearest madam for entreating you to excuse my staying some time longer at quebec i have the sincerest esteem for sir george and am not insensible of the force of our engagements, but do not think his being there a reason for my coming. The kind of suspended state, to say no more, in which those engagements now are, call for a delicacy in my behaviour to him, which is so difficult to observe without the appearance of affectation, that his absence relieves me from a very painful kind of restraint. For the same reason, tis impossible for me to come up at the time he does if i do come even though miss fermor should accompany me a moment's reflection should convince you of the propriety of my staying here till his mother does me the honour again to approve his choice or till our engagement is publicly known to be at an end mrs clayton is a prudent mother and a woman of the world and may consider that sir george's situation is changed since she consented to his marriage i am not capricious but I will own to you that my esteem for Sir George is much lessened by his behaviour since his last return from New York. He mistakes me extremely, if he supposes he has the least additional merit in my eyes from his late acquisition of fortune. On the contrary, I now see faults in him which were concealed by the mediocrity of his situation before, and which do not promise happiness to a heart like mine, a heart which has little taste for the false glitter of life and the most lively when possible for the calm, real delights of friendship and domestic felicity. Accept my sincerest congratulations for your return of health, and believe me, my dearest madam, your obliged and affectionate, Emily Montague. Letter 45 To Miss Rivers, Clare Street, Sillery, November 23. I have been seeing the last ship go out of the port, Lucy. You have no notion what a melancholy sight it is. We are now left to ourselves, and shut up from all the world for the winter. Somehow we seem so forsaken, so cut off from the rest of humankind. I cannot bear the idea. I sent a thousand sighs and a thousand tender wishes to dear England, which I never loved so much as at this moment. Do you know, my dear, I could cry if I was not ashamed. I shall not absolutely be in spirits again this week. Tis the first time I have felt anything like bad spirits in Canada." I followed the ship with my eyes till it turned Point Levi, and when I lost sight of it, felt as if I had lost everything dear to me on earth. I'm not particular. I see a gloom on every countenance, 
I have been at church, and think I never saw so many dejected faces in my life. Adieu for the present. It will be a fortnight before I can send this letter. Another agreeable circumstance, that. Would to heaven I were in England, though I changed the bright sun of Canada for a fog. December 1. We have had a week's snow without intermission. Happily for us, your brother and the Fitz have been weather-bound all the time at Sillery, and cannot possibly get away. We have amused ourselves within doors, for there is no stirring abroad, with playing at cards, playing at shuttlecock, playing the fool, making love, and making moral reflections. Upon the whole, the week has not been very disagreeable. The snow is when we wake constantly up to our chamber windows. We are literally dug out of it every morning. As to Quebec, I give up all hopes of ever seeing it again but my comfort is that the people there cannot possibly get to the neighbours and i flatter myself very few of them have been half so well entertained at home we shall be abused i know for what is really the fault of the weather keeping these two creatures here this week the ladies hate us for engrossing two such fine fellows as your brother and fitzgerald as well as for having vastly more than our share of all the men we generally go out attended by at least a dozen without any other woman but a lively old french lady who is a flirt of my father's and will certainly be my mamma. We sweep into the General's Assembly on Thursdays, with such a train of bows as draws every eye upon us. The rest of the fellows crowd round us, the misses draw up, blush, and flutter their fans, and your little Belle sits down with such a saucy and pertinent consciousness in her countenance as is really provoking. Emily, on the contrary, looks mild and humble, and seems by her civil decent air to apologise to them for being so much more agreeable than themselves which is a fault I, for my part, am not in the least inclined to be ashamed of. Your idea of Quebec, my dear, is perfectly just. It is like a third or fourth-rate country town in England. Much hospitality, little society, cards, scandal, dancing, and good cheer, all excellent things to pass away a winter evening, and peculiarly adapted to what I am told, and what I begin to feel, of the severity of this climate. I am told they abuse me, which I can easily believe, because my impertinence to them deserves it but what care i you know lucy so long as i please myself and am at sillery out of the sound they are squabbling at quebec i hear about i cannot tell what therefore shall not attempt to explain some dregs of old disputes it seems which have had not time to settle however we newcomers have certainly nothing to do with these matters you can't think how comfortable we feel at sillery out of the way my father says the politics of canada are as complex and as difficult to be understood as those of the germanic system for my part, I think no politics worth attending to but those of the little commonwealth of woman. If I can maintain my empire over hearts, I leave the men to quarrel for everything else. I observe a strict neutrality, that I may have a chance for admirers amongst both parties. Adieu, the post is just going out. Your faithful, A. Fermor. Letter 46 To Miss Montague at Sillery Montreal, December 18th there is something my dear emily in what you say as to the delicacy of your situation but whilst you are so very exact in acting up to it on one side do you not a little overlook it on the other i am extremely unwilling to say a disagreeable thing to you but miss firmer is too young as well as too gay to be a protection the very particular circumstance you mention makes Mr. Melmoth's the only house in Canada in which, if I have any judgment, you can, with propriety, live till your marriage takes place. You extremely injure Sir George in supposing it possible he should fail in his engagements, and I see with pain that you are more quick-sighted to his failings than is quite consistent with that tenderness which, allow me to say, he has a right to expect from you he is like other men of his age and fortune he is the very man you so lately thought amiable and of whose love you cannot without injustice have a doubt though i approve your content of the false glitter of the world yet i think it a little strained at your time of life did i not know you as well as i do i should say that philosophy in a young and especially a female mind is so out of season as to be extremely suspicious the pleasures which attend on affluence are too great and too pleasing to youth to be overlooked except when under the influence of a livelier passion take care my emily i know the goodness of your heart but i also know its sensibility remember that 
if your situation requires great circumspection in your behaviour to sir george it requires much greater to every other person it is even more delicate than marriage itself i shall expect you and miss firmer as soon as the roads are such that you can travel agreeably and as you object to sir george as a conductor i will entreat captain firmer to accompany you hither i am my dear your most affectionate e melmoth letter forty seven to mrs melmoth at montreal Saliri, december twenty sixth i entreat you my dearest madam to do me the justice to believe i see my engagement to sir george in as strong a light as you can do if there is any change in my behaviour to him it is owing to the very apparent one in his conduct to me of which no one but myself can be a judge as to what you say in regard to my contempt of affluence i can only say it is in my character whether it is generally in the female one or not will the cruel hint you are pleased to give just be assured sir george would be the first person to whom i would declare it i hope however it is possible to esteem merit without offending the most sacred of all engagements a gentleman waits for this i have only time to say that miss fermore thanks you for your obliging invitation and promises she will accompany me to montreal as soon as the river st lawrence can bear carriages as the upper road is extremely inconvenient i am my dearest madam you are obliged and faithful emily montague letter forty eight to miss rivers clare street sillery december twenty seven after a fortnight's snow we have had near as much clear blue sky and sunshine the snow is six feet deep so that we may be said to walk on our own heads that is speaking on philosoph we occupy the space we should have done in summer if we had done so or to explain it more clearly our heels are now where our heads should be the scene is a little changed for the worse the lovely landscape is now one undistinguished waste of snow only a little diversified by the great variety of evergreens in the woods the romantic winding path down the side of the hill to our farm on which we used to amuse ourselves with seeing the beau serpentes is now a confused frightful rugged precipice which one trembles at the idea of ascending there is something exceedingly agreeable in the whirl of the carrioles which fly along at the rate of twenty miles an hour and really hurry one out of one's senses our little coterie is the object of great envy we live just as we like without thinking of other people which i am not sure here is prudent but it is pleasant which is a better thing emily who is the civilest creature breathing is for giving up her own pleasure to avoid offending others and wants me every time we make a carrioling party to invite all the misses of quebec to go with us because they seem angry at our being happy without them but for that very reason i persist in my own way and consider wisely that though civility is due to other people yet there is also some civility due to oneself i agree to visit everybody but think it mighty absurd i must not take a ride without asking a hundred people i scarce know to go with me yet this is the style here they will neither be happy themselves nor let anybody else adieu december twenty nine i will never take a beaver's word again as long as i live there is no supporting this cold the canadians say it is seventeen years since there has been so severe a season i thought beavers had been people of more honour adieu i can no more the ink freezes as i take it from the standish to the paper though close to a large stove don't expect me to write again till may one's faculties are absolutely congealed this weather yours a fermor end of letters forty three through forty eight